person right now. Children are dismissed to Children's Church. And as they make their way, please look to the screens. This is, if it goes to the next one, you may have to help me out up there. This is Corey Ten Boom, and she, along with her family, helped rescue over 800 Jews from the Nazis in World War II. But she was eventually caught. Her father was killed within six months of being caught, and she and her sister Betsy were taken to a Nazi death camp. And just listen to what she has to say in regards to that whole situation. She wrote, Often I have heard people say how good God is. We prayed that it would not rain for our church picnic and look at the lovely weather. Yes, God is good when He sends good weather. But God was also good when He allowed my sister, Betsy, to starve to death before my eyes in a German concentration camp. I remember one occasion when I was very discouraged there. Everything around us was dark, and there was darkness in my heart. But I remember telling Betsy that I thought God had forgotten us, and she said, No, Corey. He has not forgotten us. Remember His Word. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is His steadfast love towards those who fear Him. In her suffering, Corey's sister, Betsy, realized that God's love never fails. She realized that there is a God who is sovereign and who is working all things together for the greatest good, His glory, which brings about the greatest joy for all of those who trust in Him. She realized, she recognized, that as she was starving to death, that it was not a situation that God wasn't in control of, but that God was in control of it, and He was working it towards good, and that God was still worthy of all of her praise, of all of her devotion, of all of her trust. And what was the result? Was her devotion misplaced? Did she trust in the wrong thing? Absolutely not. As a result of her suffering and death, what did she receive? The greatest joy there is to be propelled into heaven, into the presence of God Almighty, eternal life, eternal peace, absolute perfection, total joy. That was the result. It was victory. And not only that, but her sister Corey, as a result of seeing Betsy's testimony of suffering and death, what happened? Good is what happened. Because Corey learned who God is. And she said, after seeing her sister starve to death, there is an ocean of God's love available. There is plenty for everyone. May God grant you to never doubt His victorious love, whatever the circumstances. That's good. And not only that, as a result of Betsy's testimony, others, including us today, are being encouraged, are being lifted up to trust in the God who really is sovereign, who really is in control, and who really is working all things together for good, His greatest glory, which is our greatest joy. And that's exactly what we're going to see in God's Word today. As we can see and, and have heard in Betsy's life, we're going to see in Daniel's life that God is in control, that God is working all things together for good, and that He is still and He is always worthy of all of our praise, all of our trust, all of our devotion. And when we devote our life to Him by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, the result is always unconquerable joy. It is always unsurpassed peace. It is always victory. It is always good. Turn in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 2. 
where we will see this truth. And we're a people that like to stand up and sit down, so we're going to stand up again, and we're going to read God's Word. And we stand not because we just like to stand, because it's just one way we can show the sovereign God reverence for the truth that He has revealed to us. So let's read His Word together. Daniel chapter one, starting, or excuse me, excuse me, Daniel chapter two, starting in verse one, reads: In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His spirit was troubled, and his sleep, his sleep left him. The king commanded that the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans be summoned to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king, and the king said to them, "I had a dream." And my spirit is troubled to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans said to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will show you the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The word from me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you shall be torn limb from limb, and your house shall be laid in ruins. But if you show the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and its interpretation. They answered a second time and said, let the king tell his servants the dream and we will show you the interpretation. The king answered and said, I know with certainty that you are trying to gain time because you see that the word from me is firm. If you do not make the dream known to me, There is but one sentence for you. You have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the times change. Therefore, tell me the dream, and and I shall know that you can show me its interpretation. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand. For no great and powerful king has asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or Chaldean. The thing that the king asks is difficult, and no one can show it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. Because of this, the king was angry and very furious and commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. So the decree went out, and the wise men were about to be killed, and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Then Daniel replied with prudence and discretion to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He declared to Arioch, the, cap- the king's captain, why is the decree of the king so urgent? Then Arioch made the matter known to Daniel. And Daniel went in and requested the king to appoint him a time that he might show the interpretation to the king. Then Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, and told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. And then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise, for you have given me wisdom and might, and you have made known to me what we asked of you. For you have made known to us the king's matter. This is God's word. Amen? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. When we come to chapter 2, verse 1, it's at a point in history where the Babylonian Empire is a rising superpower, if not the superpower of the world. They have taken over Egypt. They have taken over Israel. They have taken over the Assyrian Empire. They are a rising, if not the superpower. And they are about to construct or start construction on one of the seven wonders of the world, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar's in charge. He's the king. He's the ruler. Nebuchadnezzar has power and prestige. He has wealth. He seemingly has it all, and he's still young. 
After this, he's going to reign for 43 more years. He's young, and he has all the world has to offer. But in verse 1, what do we find? We find that he's frustrated. We find that he's troubled. We find that he doesn't have peace. He doesn't have the answers that he needs. Why? Because God has given him a dream, and he can't comprehend it. He doesn't understand it. He doesn't get it. He's confused by it. He's tossing and turning over it. Now, why would a king like Nebuchadnezzar, who seemingly has it all, be so disturbed, be so distraught, be so shaken by just a dream? It's because in this day and age, in the region that we're in right here in this chapter, dreams were considered glimpses into the future. Glimpses into the future that the dreamer could see and thus prepare for the future or try to work in such a way to change his future. And Nebuchadnezzar has had a dream and he doesn't understand it, he doesn't get it, and the future is uncertain. So what does he do? He does what we all typically do when we first face a problem. He looks to himself and he finds himself wanting. He finds himself inadequate. He finds himself tossing and turning. He finds himself unable to provide the answers which will give him the peace that he needs. He is inadequate. So what does he do? He goes to the wisdom of the world. We see in verse 2 that he goes to the magicians. The Hebrew word there is a reference to scholars who thought through their knowledge they could divine the future. He also brings in the enchanters. Who were they? Those were people who consulted the dead and thought as a result of consulting the dead, they would find out the future. Here we go. We have another sorcerers who thought they could cast spells and thus control a person's future. Chaldeans, that can be a reference to anyone in Babylon. It's another name for a Babylonian. But it's also a reference to a specific group of people called astrologers at this time period who thought they could look up into the sky and discern one's future. And every single one of these groups of people had what's called dream books, recordings of dreams in various instances of what a person could dream. And they would take a person's dream and use these dream books to interpret the person's reality or future. The wisdom of men. And Nebuchadnezzar goes to the wisdom of men to find the answers that he needs to get the peace that he needs. And how do these wise men Respond. Look at verse 4. Then the Chaldeans said to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever! Tell your servants the dream, and we will show you the interpretation. Do you think they're just a little bit confident? I think so. And you can understand why. They're advisors to one of the most powerful people on earth. They've helped establish this huge empire. They're about to help this man construct one of the seven wonders of the world. They think they have this. They think their wisdom is enough to bring about the peace that Nebuchadnezzar is seeking. But as you know, their confidence is very quickly shattered. And the wisdom of man is shown for what it really is. Inadequate. Inadequate. Look at verse The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, the word from me is firm. I'm not going to change my mind. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you shall be torn limb from limb and your houses shall be laid in ruins. I wonder what that did to their confidence. Verse 6, but if you show the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive gifts For me, gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and its interpretation. And from here, we have a back and forth. Because these wise men don't really understand at first what he's asking for. Or they understand and they don't like it. Nebuchadnezzar wants them not only to interpret his dream, but without him telling the dream, for them to tell him his dream and the interpretation. That's what he wants. That's what he wants. Now, some scholars would say, you know what? Nebuchadnezzar, 
there's a possibility that he doesn't even know the dream himself. And that's why he's asking this of these Chaldeans, these wise men. He doesn't know the dream. He wants them to tell him what he dreamed and to interpret it. I can see, and you can do that with valid exegesis here, you can come to that conclusion. But I believe there's a different reason. I believe that Nebuchadnezzar, he's really seeking the truth. He really wants real peace. He doesn't want a fake answer. So I think he knows the dream, and he's testing the wisdom of man. He's saying, is the wisdom of man enough? Is it the right answer? Is it the place I should run to? So we ask these Chaldeans, these sorcerers, these magicians, these wise men, the wisest of the age, and what's their response? Look at verse 10. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demands. There is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demands, for no great power, no great and powerful king has asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or Chaldean. The thing that the king asks is difficult, and no one can show it to the king except the gods, whose dwelling is not with flesh. What's their response? They're forced to admit that the wisdom of man is inadequate. That the wisdom of man is, does not have the capability to answer Nebuchadnezzar's question and bring about the peace that he so longs and needs. They declare loudly for everyone to hear that they, no one else, and also King Nebuchadnezzar is inadequate. Inadequate. And what is King Nebuchadnezzar's response. You know the response. It's the same general response the world gives when they are told that they're inadequate. When the world is told, you can't do this on your own. When the world is told that that peace that you long for, you can't find it in yourself and you can't find it in the wisdom of man, what is the response? What is the response? It's pride. It's to say, how dare you tell me I'm inadequate, that I can't find the answers to my questions within myself or among the wisdom of men. How dare you tell me that I need the divine? How dare you tell me that? It's the same response 19th, 18th century German philosopher fancy name Frederick would call him, gave when he was presented with this dilemma, answers he couldn't answer, or questions he couldn't answer and peace he couldn't give. If there is a God, how can I bear not to be that God? That's called pride. And that's the exact response that King Nebuchadnezzar gives. He won't accept the truth. He won't believe the truth. He believes he's self-reliant. He's self-confident. He doesn't need the divine. And he's so filled with pride, and he's so insulted by the response of these wise men, what does he do? You know what he does. He initiates the annihilation of all of these men. Look at verse 12. Because of this, the king was angry and very furious and commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. Nebuchadnezzar has been facing a problem. And he has refused to go to the sovereign one. He has refused to go to the one God who's in control and give him the peace that he needs. Instead, he sought peace within himself. He sought peace amongst the wisdom of man. And what has been the result? It's been no answers. It's been no peace. It's been no joy. It's been, let me wreak havoc on my own kingdom. Now look at verse 13. The decree went out, and the wise men were about to be killed, and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Daniel finds out in the following verses. Now just imagine being Daniel. 
In chapter 1, we saw that he was preserved through the Holocaust that was thrust upon Judah. In chapter 1, we saw that Daniel devoted himself with his companions to following hard after God. He refused to eat this food at the cost of his own life and obey God, and God rescued him from that. And then after that, God gives him wisdom ten times greater than all of the Babylonians. You could just see, Daniel, I could see myself if I was Daniel, hearing all this news, hearing about my impending death, and raising my hands and saying, what was chapter one for? Why did you do that? What type of plan is this? Are you really in control? Why rescue me when all that's going to happen is... I'm going to be slaughtered as a result of the failure of other men and as a result of a dream given to a guy who's too prideful to admit that you exist. But that's not Daniel's response. You know his response. What does he do? He goes to King Nebuchadnezzar. He asks for a time, a meeting with him. And throughout this whole process, what is his attitude? What is his demeanor? Look at verse 14. He's about to be killed. The person who's in charge of killing him is facing him. Verse 14, Then Daniel replied with prudence and discretion to Arioch, the captain of king's guard who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He declared to Arioch, the king's guard, Why is this decree so urgent? Then Arioch made the matter known to Daniel. Now look at verse 14. He replied with prudence and discretion. It could also be translated calm and wisdom or calm and tact. It seems like Daniel's not too shaken. It's almost the exact opposite of Nebuchadnezzar's response to a problem. Nebuchadnezzar is fearful. Nebuchadnezzar is turning and tossing. But Daniel is calm, and he exercises wisdom. Why? Because he knows that God is sovereign. Because he knows even in this bizarre, unfair, deadly, horrific circumstance, God in his wisdom and in his might is going to work all things together for good, his glory, which will result in Daniel's ultimate joy. So what does Daniel do? He doesn't go to himself looking deep, deep, deep down inside and look for answers. He doesn't look among the wisdom of man. He goes to the sovereign one. He runs to the sovereign one. Look at verse 17. Then Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, and told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. And who is in control? Who is sovereign? Who is ruling over all? Who's working all of this together for good? And for his glory, it is the God of the Bible. It is Yahweh, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that's proven by the next verse. Look at verse 19. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of night. Daniel is on death row. He needs answers. He needs peace. And he, unlike Nebuchadnezzar, goes to the sovereign one. And he finds it. And he has it. And what is the result? What is the result? First, it's glory given unto God. Look at verse 20. Daniel answered and said, before he runs off to Nebuchadnezzar and tells him, I know the solution, don't kill me, his priority is what? Glorifying God. First he goes and glorifies God. That's the first result. Verse 20, Daniel answered and said, blessed be the name of God forever and ever. To whom belong wisdom and might, he changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give praise and wisdom, for you have given me wisdom and might, and have made known to me what we asked of you, for you have made me no made known to us the king's matter. This is basically Daniel shouting out, God, you're sovereign. In this horrific, bizarre, unsituation, you're still in control. And good is the result for all of those devoted to you. 
Look at how he describes his sovereignty. Verse 21, he changes times and seasons. You and I are subject to time and seasons. We don't change time. It just keeps on going. We're not in control of seasons. We're subject to seasons. But God's outside of time. He's in control of time. And he created seasons. And he created time. He is absolutely sovereign. Look at the next line. He removes kings and sets up kings. Isn't that a line for Nebuchadnezzar? Nebuchadnezzar is self-confident, self-reliant, a self-made man in his own mind. He has risen the power from his perspective, through his lineage, through his wisdom, through his might. He's taken over other kingdoms, all as a result of how great he is. But that's absolutely false. He didn't rise the power on his own. He didn't thwart God and get there. What did we see last week? 2 Kings 20, 90 years before this event. What happened? God went to Hezekiah through the prophet Isaiah and prophesied 90 years before this event that Babylon would rise up in power and take over the nation of Israel. That's before Nebuchadnezzar was born. Who's in control? Who's sovereign? Who's working all things together according to the plan that he designates, that he puts in place. It's the God of the Bible. Look at the next line. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. So often, the world declares that wisdom is attained through hard study or that wisdom is attained through multiple failures. You know what? You can fail all you want and never learn anything. That's called being an addict. And you know what? We're all addicts. We all sin continuously every single one of us. Wisdom is not attained because we're just so darn searching hard after it. What does Proverbs say? The beginning of wisdom is what? The fear of God. It's going to God, the author of wisdom, and receiving it. That's the source of it all. It's the sovereign one. These wise men, do they have a clue? They know a lot of facts but they don't know what life is about and they don't know who's in control and they don't know how to live it. Wisdom is from above. It is the Father who gives good gifts. God is sovereign. And what's the result for Daniel here? The result overall is first God is glorified. What's the result for Daniel? What does he get as as a result of being devoted to the sovereign one? He gets the peace. He gets the joy. He gets the victory that is unconquerable, and we all long for and need. He gets the answers. And you can just see the joy in this text. You can see him. He's not whispering this. This is him proclaiming to the heavens, God, you are who you say you are. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise. You're the one. You receive the glory. You get it all. And that's my greatest joy. God, you are sovereign, and you are indeed working all things together for good, the ultimate good, which is your glory, which results in the joy of those devoted to him. Three applications really quick to this message. The first is, realize you're not sovereign. Realize you and I are not sovereign. We don't control jack squat. That's becoming a favorite phrase of mine lately, isn't it? You and I can't even control ourselves. Romans 8, we do what we don't want to do and don't do what we want to do. Did I mix that up? No, I think it was right. We can hardly even control ourselves. We all mess things up all the time. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how young you are. It doesn't matter if you have a ton of experience or no experience. It doesn't matter if you have all the education or no education. We all mess things up every day. We all do what we don't want to do and don't do what we should do. We're not in control. Absolutely not. It's just as 1 John 1, 8 says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. We are just helpless. What about the future? Do we know what it's all about? Absolutely not. James 4.13, come now you who say today or tomorrow we shall go to this or that city, spend a year there, there carry on business and make a profit. You don't even know what will happen tomorrow. I love that last line. It's just so clear. 
It just puts us in our place. We're not sovereign. The future is not ours. Despite what Disney says, we don't control our destiny. Just as Proverbs 19.21 says, many plans are in the man's heart, but the purpose of the Lord, Yahweh, the sovereign one, who's really in control, will prevail. God is sovereign. We are not. And that's the first thing we need to realize. Unlike Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar was self-reliant. He was self-confident. He was full of pride. And thus he refused the solution that he so desperately needed, the divine solution. First application of this message is, recognize you're not sovereign and neither am I. The second application is run to the sovereign. Run to the sovereign. Nebuchadnezzar didn't run to the sovereign. And what was the result? All he got from looking within himself for the solution for the peace that he longed for, all he got from looking to the wisdom of man was frustration that he took out in an extreme way. He was mad at the world as a result and he let everyone know it. That was the result. There was no peace. There was no joy. No answers. Just wrecking everything he thought he had built up. But what did Daniel do? He went to the sovereign he bent the knee. He humbled himself. He recognized that he was not in control, but he indeed could go by grace through faith to the God who was and is today. So the first application is this. Recognize we're not sovereign. To run to the sovereign. You may be asking, how do I do that? First, the first way in which we do that is by believing in what the sovereign God has done through his son, Jesus Christ. That's the first way we run to the sovereign and find eternal peace, eternal hope, and the joy that is unconquerable. How do you do that? How do you turn to the son? You believe that the son of God, Jesus Christ, came to this earth in the flesh, died on the cross. Why? To pay the price for all of your and my jacking up. Pay the price on the cross and then rise again from the dead so that all who place their faith in him can have eternal life. And what is the result of that? You can look to the future and you can see death. And you don't have to think, oh shoot, when's it going to happen? I'm super worried. You don't have to worry about what's going to happen afterwards because you're going to know what's going to happen afterwards. You're not going to get what you deserve, what we all deserve, you're going to get what you don't deserve, which is heaven, which is the grace of God. That's the first way we run to the sovereign one and experience peace that surpasses all understanding, experience hope that is unconquerable. Maybe you're here today and you're like, I've done that, but I'm facing something that is extremely difficult. And I don't want to demean that. I don't want to say it isn't hard. But I do want to say that God is still sovereign in your situation and in mine. And I will say that because that's what God, God's word teaches. And that when you run to the sovereign in your situation, whether it's a marital situation, a family situation, a financial situation, a health situation, what will be the result of you running to the sovereign one, devoting yourself to him? It will be good. It will be peace that surpasses understanding. It will be victory. Because God is faithful and he follows through and we can always say in him, it is well. So first application, recognize you're not sovereign and I'm not sovereign. Run to the sovereign one in all things because good is the result. And two or three, I can't count, Rejoice, that's four, wow, terrible. Three, <laughs> rejoice in the sovereign. The world's not spinning off course into some aimless existence that has no purpose. No, this creation was created with a purpose by a God who's sovereign and working all things together for his glory, which is our ultimate joy. That's reason to sing as Chris encouraged us at the beginning, 
That's reason to rejoice. That's reason to proclaim. That's reason to dedicate every moment to the Sovereign One. That's reason to give Him the praise He deserves. God is good. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let us pray. God, I thank You for the powerful testimony of Daniel. How when facing death, he understood who you are. How when we, like Daniel, face our situations, face our hardships, we can have the same resolve. We have you. You are the sovereign one. You are in control. And we can trust that every single aspect of our life, as we have devoted it to you, has a reason, has a purpose, and the result is good. Dear God, that's good news. That's great joy. That's reason to get out of bed and face another day. That's reason to do what you want us to do. That's reason to abandon our own plan and adopt your plan. God, you are so good. Your word proves it. And we're a people that proclaim it. And we're a people that are encouraged by it. We pray this all in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, the greatest demonstration of good that came within the greatest evil. We pray this all in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing His praise.